Uh, Theresa May has this self-imposed deadline for the end of this month, but the timing here is really critical. Not only do we have the Dutch elections uh, tomorrow, but we also have a Scottish National Party conference later on uh, in a few days. Indeed, and I think that the date that's being touted around in London right now is that she will trigger it on March the 27th. Of course, that fits in her deadline like she laid out six months ago. But politics is moving very quickly, and once that starting gun is fired, how the talks go are, of course, contingent upon domestic politics here in the UK, with Scotland particularly coming to mind, and, of course, how the national elections in France, Germany, and the Netherlands play out on the continent. That doesn't fundamentally change the fact that the UK will be leaving the EU, but it does perhaps change the content of the negotiations, which only begin in earnest once Article 50 is triggered. And then the EU 27 need to come to a common position as to what their negotiating position is going to be. So I think only in about June or July are we actually going to see the beginning of the negotiations. Very short timetable because, of course, they want to have it complete by October 2018. So you brought up uh, Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister of Scotland, saying she wanted to have another referendum on uh, Scottish Scotland leaving the UK, I think, uh, end, near the end of 2018 or early 2019. In theory, that could uh, even be before the Brexit negotiations are done. So A, is that a plausible timetable? And B, does Sturgeon actually have the leverage to get a binding vote the way uh, Cameron gave Salmond to vote? So technically, Scotland can't have a binding referendum without the consent of the British government. So the question is whether or not Theresa May, first of all, actually even agrees to grant them this referendum. Now, if she doesn't give them the referendum, the fear is that she would really stroke up Scottish nationalist sentiment, and therefore she's just kicking the can down the road, and this is an issue that will reopen. As for the timetable, I think it's undoubtedly true that if Theresa May does agree to give Scotland a second referendum, she certainly won't agree to give, the, give it to them between uh, the time frame that Theresa May, uh, excuse me, that Nicola Sturgeon laid out as her preferred timetable, because that is, of course, right in the middle of the Brexit negotiations. And I don't think the, the government in Westminster would want to have two parallel negotiations going on, one with the EU and the second with Scotland. So I think on the issue of timing, uh, that's certainly not settled at all. I think it'd be difficult for Theresa May not to grant them a referendum, though. When uh, David Cameron allowed the referendum, the UK was very much part of the EU. How crucial is Scotland to the UK economy uh, now that the UK will no longer be part of the EU? Well, undoubtedly, Scotland has much closer ties to the rest of the UK than it does to the EU. Nonetheless, this is a politically very emotional topic. When the SNP, uh, you know, were re-elected by a huge majority into Scottish Parliament last year, they stood on a manifesto saying this was ahead of the referendum that should circumstances change, such as Scotland being dragged out of the EU against its will, that they would reserve the right to hold a second referendum. And that is, of course, the narrative which uh, Nicola Sturgeon has seized upon. Uh, I think it's very interesting to point out that I think number 10 was taken on the back foot when Nicola Sturgeon made this speech yesterday saying that she would indeed be starting the legislative process to, to call for a second referendum. But that is really unsurprising if you consider the political context and the SNP's ultimate goal of independence from the UK. So I don't think economic considerations are firm, foremost here. It's far mm. more political and emotional. Now, with the first Scottish referendum, at that point, the UK was still a member of the EU in good standing. I know technically it's still an EU member, but it's walking out the door. And the other EU countries would be disinclined to allow Scotland back in the EU, lest they encourage separatist movements in other countries who want to pull the same idea, perhaps in Spain. If the UK is out, would that make the EU more amenable to letting Scotland back in? I think that there's two things here. So I don't think the rest of the EU would agree to Scotland simply staying in the EU, given that the UK is going out. This is on the condition that an independence referendum is held and that the SNP wins that. But I think they would be far more more amenable to fast-tracking uh, the re-entry of Scotland into the EU or into the EEA, and simply because that is a huge symbolic w win for them if Scotland leaves the UK, where it has you know, much longer historical ties, much more uh, in-depth economic ties, and then says they want to join the EU. Now, this is going to be a hugely uh, you know, great boost for the EU at a time when nationalistic sentiment is running high and when the EU, the whole project, is you know, in, in a lot of trouble. Well, speaking of projects, uh, let's move on here to the Dutch election. Uh, it's seen kind of as a litmus test for populism in Europe. Is it really, though? Because uh, Gert Wilder 
did I pronounce that correctly? Kurt Wilders. Kurt think. Wilders. Okay, Kurt Wilders. He's on poor terms with uh, the other Dutch political leaders, and most other parties have ruled out a tie-up with his Freedom Party. What is the extent of his influence when it comes to the overall functioning of, of the Dutch Parliament? Well, I think that it's important to point out that Gert Wilders, even if he isn't going to win, even if he doesn't win the larger share of the vote, it's nonetheless he's on track to become the second largest party. So this is uh, an important indication of the, the direction of populist and far-right anti-Islamic anti-immigrant movements that you're seeing sprouting across the EU. And this is, of course, a theme that's going to become apparent in the French election, also in the German election later this year. Uh, on the actual technical issue of whether or not he can become the next leader of the Netherlands, I think it's impossible because even if he were to win the larger share of seats in Parliament, his party were to do that, none of the other political parties will go into coalition with him. It's still very taboo. So I think that Whilst this is, um, you know, a trend that one cannot deny or ignore, you know, the rise of far-right populist movements in the EU, on this one, I think that Rutte might just be saved by the skin of his teeth. Uh, you've been watching the rise of populist parties in Europe for a while. Uh, the latest polls out of the Netherlands show Wilders' party seems to be fading. But there's this idea out there that these kinds of parties tend to do better in actual votes than in the polls because people get in the ballot box and they won't admit to someone that they support him. Is that borne out by the facts, in your opinion, that these sort of movements and parties do better in the ballots than the polls? I think so. I think that it's uh, far too dangerous to ascribe far too much weight to the polls because, as we've seen in the past few years, also in the U.S., they can be wrong. So we could be up for some more political upset this year in Europe, certainly.